Amen. Welcome, Church on the Move. Give God a hand this morning, would you? Everybody get loose, get all woken up, okay? Sometimes when we don't have the drums here, our songs start off a little softer, and I can see everybody kind of just kind of fading into that wonderful spot with Jesus. Don't do that. I got a word, a message for you today I'd like you to hear. So welcome, Church on the Move. We have uh, kind of a visitor with us here today. Doris's son, Paul, is with us from Canada. Yeah. Welcome, Paul. Uh, Paul is... Uh, uh, gosh, we've known him for quite some time now, uh, but he's, he comes and visits, visits his wonderful mother, because I mean, geez, Doris. She has so many redeeming qualities. The only one I can really think of right now is chocolate chip cookies, but <laughs> praise God for that recipe. Paul, hang on to that. But he's here visiting with us, and I would encourage you. He has a, a, a ministry called uh, Plum Line Ministries, and uh, he puts a blog out that Dar Doris has been sharing with me, and there's just some excellent stuff in there, excellent stuff. Now, normally I would tell you not to go read it because I could use it for sermon material later, right? And you'd think it was my genuine idea, but, you know, you really should do that. It's plumblineministries.org, I believe. Yeah, go visit that. There's some uh, wonderful wisdom there, and uh, uh, I would encourage you to, to go and, and to read that and to send encouraging messages and support, Paul, because when you step out, there's been some changes he stepped out into a new ministry and when you begin to share your heart especially online my word be encouraging to him amen amen well you'll notice that we have uh kind of fewer people here uh, we're missing quite a few people uh, we have had quite an outbreak recently in our community uh with uh, positive covid cases so just being responsible and making sure that those who have uh, tested positive for covid are, are just not coming to church today, they'll they'll partake online with us, but just to be careful and make sure that we don't uh, create a, a situation, a negative situation. So be praying for those people, um, just making sure that uh, they get through that uh, well. Now, uh, Perlongs, are you here? Scott, yes, excellent. So, so Scott and his family are from Ohio, right? And they are huge Ohio State Buckeye fans, right? Which I'll grant you, Ohio State, great program, historical program. Nobody comes into the horseshoe at Ohio State and defeats them on their own turf except for the Oregon Ducks. Amen? <laughs> Woo! Oh, my goodness. So I, I had to wear my shirt, and I have my duck shoes on today, too, to, to support them. I watched that game, and I just couldn't, couldn't help but keep thinking of him as he was watching it as well. And as it was getting down to the bitter end, and all hope was lost, and that brought me so much joy. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So. <laughs> I hope we did it. Thank you very much. That's true. That's, that's true, but you've got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. Amen. What a, what a great game. We were, my, my son and I were on the edge of our seats. So that was a great, actually, it was a really great football game. Both teams played really, really well. But, uh, but the Ducks came out victorious, and I will take that. Amen. It's the favor of God. Amen. I, I prayed harder than Scott did this week. Amen. Yeah. Uh, uh, also, a big thank you to everyone who helped out with uh, putting the sound up and everything. We, we provided the sound equipment and everything for the fair. And uh, I thought Randy delivered a great message. Uh, and he delivered that message uh, under duress because uh, his mother was passing away. And he uh, was not going to try to make it back to Canada. He was going to go ahead and deliver the message and then leave from there. I have not had an update from him, but I want you to know that because sometimes as ministers, you stand up and you do what you are called to do in the face of a lot of obstacles people can't see. So I was very grateful for him and his dedication in delivering that message. And I thought it was so great to have our church families there together. Amen. Amen. And I saw a gentleman sitting in the chair that I left there two years ago. And I didn't even get upset. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so good. We really enjoyed that service. Uh, our offering still in the buckets in the back as well as you can drop off uh, in the foyer. And, uh, you know, this was a quite a week uh, for myself and uh, my daughter Kayla uh, as we went down to San Diego to attend her boyfriend's ugh, yeah, her boyfriend's graduation from Marine Boot Camp basic training and uh, 
I mean, this is probably going to astonish you, but that's what I'll be preaching about today. Uh, God gave me something as I was standing there and watching all the families and, and, and watching their excitement just to see their, their child, their brother, uh, after 13 weeks of not being able to lay, lay eyes on him. But we went through a little bit of a experience, and my daughter went through a little bit of a challenge, and I'm going to share that with you today, which I'm sure she's real excited about. But as we move into worship, you know, I looked the scripture up, Isaiah 29, 13. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. I say that, to read that scripture to you today to remind you, don't ever let it come to that. Amen. Don't ever let tradition, don't ever let uh, your requirements for what worship will be when you walk in that door. Because as I've told you before, they play the music, you provide the experience. You provide the atmosphere of worship when you walk in that door. By what you've been doing this week, by your prayers to God, by your cries unto him, you are bringing the experience. You are bringing worship into the building. So if you ever walk away from worship saying, I just can't do that, I can't partake in that, that just wasn't for me, that's on you. We are here to entertain the presence of God. We are here to glorify him. We are here to lift him up. So let it never come to an obligation, to a tradition, or to human rules. Let's worship our king today. If you want to sit, sit. If you want to stand, stand. Raise your hands if you want. Keep them down if you want. But let your heart be open. Open to our Lord and Savior. Amen.
praise and glorify your name, Father. We praise you, we honor you, we worship you, we glorify you in this place today. Father, we thank you for every blessing that is present in our life. Father, let us focus on where we have come from, what you have delivered us from. Not the hurdles that seem to be facing us, but what you've delivered us from. You've done it once and you will do it again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody here just needs to know he hears you. That's it. He hears you. You don't feel like he does, but he wants to reinforce to you today. He hears you. Thank you, Jesus. That's for someone here. You know who you are, but he hears you. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we, we thank you so much for meeting us here at this place, for allowing us to live here in the United States, here in, in Montana, right here in Plains. Father, the blessings and the things that you have poured out into our lives, Father God, let us not forget those. Father, I pray today that the word that you have given me, as always, Lord, let it be said in your tone, not my tone. Let it be your words, not mine. Father, that you might be glorified, for it is all about you. We are so grateful. We worship and we praise and we honor you. And we ask that these words would penetrate our heart today, Father, that we would hear, we would act, and we would grow. And Father, we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great job, guys. Love our worship team, especially being able to see, yes, to see my daughters up there just does my heart so much good. You know, Kayla, my second child, we had two girls to start it off with, and Kayla's always been such a sweet little girl. And I, you think they're going to be like three or four always, right? And then you blink and one day you're on a trip with them and they're 17 years old and they're telling you everything you need to know to survive in the city because you're just an old frail man, right? Well, Kayla and I went on a journey and we had a great time. So very proud of her and, and the way that she has handled all this. You know, in a teen relationships can be very finicky, but she has said goodbye to her boyfriend for 13 weeks, and Krista and I figured, well, maybe this is it. I mean, there's not a better place for a boyfriend than the Marine Corps. And we figure maybe she'll get bored, and that'll be that. But it didn't happen. And I'm glad it didn't, because I love Phil. He is... Uh, just an awesome guy. So I entitled this sermon based on my experience there with her when two hours turns into 20 minutes. Now, we went down to San Diego, and who knows, anybody that's uh, visited a big city or maybe you've lived in one before, I don't know what the deal is, but everybody is in such a tremendous hurry to get nowhere. And I, am, I, I know that if I that if I shoved God off out of my life and that if I, if I ended up Satan as my beacon and ended up going to hell, it wouldn't be a fiery furnace or anything like that. It would be the interstate. God would put me on an interstate, making me drive with a couple million of people that I don't even know. It always amazes me when we're down there, a guy can be going 60 miles an hour in the left lane, a guy's going 104 in the right. They're crossing all the lanes just to get to the same location 
six seconds ahead of the other guy. I hate it. The most pleasurable experience I had in that city was on the beach with a homeless man who was just laying on the beach staring up, and I thought for a second it was somebody just laying out in the sun, and I realized he had his, all his possessions with him. And I stopped, and I said, how you doing? He says, I'm doing great. I said, you look like you are. I was like, you know, I think if I was going to be homeless, this might be the spot. He goes, yeah, where are you from? I said, Montana. He goes, oh, too cold. <laughs> So it's just an experience. Everywhere you turn, no matter what you do, costs you money to do it. It's just a completely different culture. <laughs> so we entered into the rat race. And throughout this entire process, as it led up to the graduation, through this entire 13-week process, actually 14 or 15 weeks it was, there were always different timelines coming out of the Marine Corps. Kayla would tell me, Dad, Phil's going to be able to, to call from boot camp. And then she'd come back, no. Then she's, Dad, Phil probably gets a 10-day leave after boot camp. No. Then, Dad, graduation's going to be September 17th. No. Dad, Phil says this isn't so bad. No. <laughs> So when we left for San Diego, I really wasn't sure what to expect. Kayla got to see him the day before the graduation ceremony, and she was elated. She talked about the upcoming two hours she would be able to spend with him after graduation. Now, before I get to that point, when she came back to me that evening after seeing him that afternoon, it was nonstop talk about Phil. Non stop talk about Phil. And I'm contemplating, I'm working through my mind here because there was a time I was the go-to guy for her. Oh. <laughs> Things are changing, folks. But she talked about the upcoming two hours she would be able to spend with him after graduation. Two hours isn't much, Dad, but it's two hours. Dad, Phil gets two hours after the ceremony. Nope. See, I can't prove it. But what I observed after graduation told me that the family was and had been in a training all of their own, supplied by the Marine Corps. All of these changes had challenged Kayla. Some left her frustrated and some left her sad. That last one left her in a puddle of tears. Her two hours had turned in to 20 minutes. That's one of the 20 minutes. They had a wonderful graduation ceremony and they brought him, he brought the family over to a spot and, and they gave, they adjusted the timeline on that two hours to 20 minutes right when we started talking to him. He had 20 minutes to talk to his mother, his father, his sisters, his brother, Kayla, myself, and it didn't seem fair. And while I process seeing my little girl's disappointment as the drill sergeant screamed him off of the parking lot, I realized it wasn't broken promises by the Marine Corps that created the pain. It was Kayla's expectations. This hit me. And of course, the comparison to our relationship with God came rushing into my heart and mind. And as I sat in the parking lot waiting for someone to let me back out for approximately the next 45 minutes, I begin to think about this. You see, God taking something away from us isn't the problem. It's when he takes away something that we have decided was promised. That's when we get a reaction. No, you promised me two hours. No, they didn't. That was, that was what she had decided and the rest of the family had decided was promised. So because of that, it was unfair. Because of that, that hurt. How many times do we go through those same scenarios in our life? God, you promised. Now, God has promises, but often when we use that phrase, it's not based on anything he ever promised us. And we find ourselves getting angry 
with God when in reality it's just based on what we have decided. Stuff happens in life. We all know that. Sometimes it's good and other times it's not. When it's good, we don't spend too much time analyzing. We just enjoy it. But when it's bad, we start asking questions and we want answers. And we're going to go find that pastor at the church and we're going to ask him. Why did this happen? Or more likely, why did this happen to me? Or you can get philosophical and ask, why do bad things happen to good people? Because the truth is, the environment in which God has chosen that we should live is less than perfect. It proves it to us every day. It has fallen, and we are not exempt from its ups and downs. So stuff happens in our lives under the sovereign control of the Lord who has intentionally given us free will and placed us in a difficult and dangerous environment. He created us for this time, right now. He did not create you to live in the 1700s or the 1800s. Nobody here is from the 1800s, right? I don't want to offend. He didn't create you for those periods of time. He created you for now, so there must be a reason for it. See, we have to ask ourselves when we come into contact with people or situations, God intended for me to put my feet on the beach in San Diego at that point in time, not in the 1940s. Because in that point in time, there was going to be a homeless man staring up at the sky, laying on the beach that needed somebody to talk to him like he was a real person, to just have a conversation Every last little instance that happens in our lives, God has created. He knows it. It's for a reason and for a purpose. But we walk around, and I watched it there in San Diego. People walk around in some sort of trance. Everything is about getting to the next location, fighting for a parking spot, being rude about it, waving at me with just one finger. You're number one, man. He created us for this time. And things come our way sometimes because we made them come our way. And sometimes they happen because of the fallen circumstances in which we live and from which we are made. Other times they happen because of the actions of others. But always under the ultimate oversight of God who rules in the affairs of men and women. God's will rules, always. So how do we handle the unpleasant things, the unpleasant moments, or maybe even worse, the tragedies? I'm going to make a few suggestions. Number one is recognize. Recognize that there is nothing fundamentally surprising about being exposed to bad things. See, I want to make sure everybody understands, because I was raised in church and at church camp, and I was raised in an environment. My mom got me in anytime she could when I wasn't racing motorcycles. And you learn a lot, and you watch, and you begin to take on the culture of your church, the culture of your church community, the culture of the camp speaker, and you begin to think you don't really study for yourself at that age. You just kind of take it at face value. This must be what it is. So growing up, it was to be a Christian meant That there was never a time that you were going to have sickness. There was never a time that you were going to have financial troubles. There was never a time that you were going to experience a bad situation, that you were going to go through some sort of challenge. Those times just weren't there. Because if you could just trust God enough, if you could just have enough faith in God, if you could just press in enough, if you could just read your Bible enough, if you could just make it to church enough, if you could just give a big enough offering, all these things were going to bypass you. I'm here to tell you that is not what the Word of God states. It doesn't mean you can't walk through those things with joy. It doesn't mean you can't walk upright in faith and know that God is going to deliver you. But the problem with that mentality is when I became older and life began to kick me square in the face, I couldn't understand why God would allow that to happen to me. Therefore, it was a God I didn't want to serve, a God I didn't want to follow, a God I didn't want to trust. 
recognized that there is nothing fundamentally surprising about being exposed to bad things. Jesus was. He warned his disciples they would be too. He intentionally left us in a world that had rejected him, and he warned that we would be treated no differently. Oftentimes, we do not want to accept that there will be trials. We spend the majority of our time in prayer trying to get God to remove us from anything uncomfortable. We find ourselves speaking against the will of God. I pray that your will be done. Not, I pray that you be done with your will. We find ourselves speaking against it. Peter showed us this very behavior in response to Jesus speaking on his death and resurrection in Mark chapter 8, 31 through 33. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. See, what Peter said didn't line up with the scriptures. It was in contradiction to the spiritual authority that was over him. It felt good. It felt good to defend God. It felt good to tell him, you don't have to go to the cross. It felt good to be on that side of things, but it wasn't right. Even reading it today, I want to side with Peter. But the problem with Peter's rebuke of Jesus is it supported Satan's agenda, not God's. We're watching this take place throughout our nation right now in a sweeping fashion. And the church has walked right into a trap. And nobody wants to hear it. Jesus exposed how Peter came into this way of thinking. He didn't make a deliberate choice to reject God and embrace Satan. He simply let his mind settle on the things of men instead of the things of God. And Satan, surprised, took advantage of it. He let his mind settle on the things of men instead of the things of God. If you can review real quickly within the last couple years of your life, have there been times when you have let your mind settle on the things of men? I know I have. It's a divisive trick and it happens overnight and before you know it, you are glued to the television set, you are glued to the news, you are glued to the social media, and you are glued to what is being fed to you by man. Because you have let your mind settle on the things of men instead of the things of God. Philippians 4.8 Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. True, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, things of excellence. Is that what we are putting our minds on? Now, I want you to listen to how Peter's tone is about to shift after he puts his mind upon the things of God and not man. So remember, same man is rebuking God that he's going to go to the cross, rebuking them that he's going to allow the Roman rulers to crucify him, rebuking him. And now he puts a little time under his belt. Now he puts some experience under his belt. Now he's pressed into who God is, and he's walked out into life a little bit, and he's begun to experience it. And this is the same man writing this scripture, 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Peter has made a big shift here because he has switched from the things of men to the things of God. He switched from a scripture that was, was talking about him in a fearful stance to a scripture that shows him in a faithful stance, that shows him in a presence of joy, not of fear. Do not be surprised. They're going to happen. When he set his mind on the things of man, it seems strange to Peter that his master should think of suffering. 
But now that he sets his mind on the things of God, he thinks it strange that he could have imagined anything else. That's what recognizing who God truly is can change your perspective and your frame of mind. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not here to preach a sermon to tell you. I want you guys to be so excited to walk out of here and get hit by a bus. I want you to be so excited to walk out of here and go through tribulation and to go through tough things in your life. But I'm telling you, there's not one thing that God has allowed me to go through in my life that has not produced fruit on the backside. And that's where it comes into trusting who he really is because he does have your best interest at hand. The second is remember that what God permits in your life will never outstrip the grace he makes available to enable you to live well in it. He doesn't promise escape from difficulties, but he does guarantee grace to live well in them. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul tells the Corinthians, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God has promised to supervise the temptation that comes at us through the world, the flesh, and the enemy. He promises to limit it according to our capability to endure it. But here comes the meat of this scripture. According to our capability as we rely on him, not our capability as we rely on ourselves. Very much that scripture could read, he has given you the ability through him to endure all things. See, on our own, we're not going to make it. On our own, we are going to succumb to the temptations. On our own, we're not going to have any success. But through him and through what he can endure, or we can endure through him, we can have success. We can have a future. It can be bright. Amen? Sometimes things, I've had things in my life that have come at me and completely leveled me, and I've not wanted to live. I've wanted to take my own life. There have been those times when I came back to the Lord, I was crying out to him in a dark room, not sure what to do or what to do next. I just knew I needed to cry out to him because I could not handle this. It was nothing that I did other than submit myself to him, and then the burden was put on his shoulders, not mine. And then I begin to see joy, and then I begin to see hope. It's got to be completely given over to him. We cannot rely on ourselves. It has to be reliance on him. Because make no mistake, Satan would destroy us and admit it if God would let him. God keeps us from things we can't handle. And as we rely more on him and less on ourselves, what we can and can't handle changes. That's called growth. I can think of things that I went through. Well, for instance, since I've already thrown Kayla out there, my daughter's feelings are real. My daughter's emotions are real. This is the first major relationship she's been invested in. They're all real. But on the back side of it, 47 years old, I'm watching her cry in the car, and I'm thinking, that's sad. What are we going to have for lunch? I'm sure I went through heartaches. I'm sure I went through issues when I was her age, and things seemed so huge, but they're just not that big anymore. That's not because I don't care. It's growth. It's growth. Our experiences help us to what we can and can't handle changes. The third is to reflect. Reflect on the way that difficulties are often the means to development and growth. I hate it, but it's the truth. Romans 5, 4 through 5, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, a Christian should be willing to be tried, 
They should be pleased to let their religion be put to the test. There, says he, hammer away if you like. Do you want to be carried to heaven on a feather bed? Interpretation there, it ain't going to be easy. This life is not easy. Every day you're going to be challenged. Every day there's going to be something in your path, and it's not, God, why did you put it here? Why would you do this to me? It's in a whole different context, in a whole different tone. You say, God, why did you place this here? How can I learn from this? How will this help me grow? Perseverance leads to character, and character leads to hope. One virtue builds upon another as we grow in the pattern of Jesus. See, most every Christian wants to develop character, and they want to have more hope. But the part that gets overlooked is that these qualities spring out of perseverance, which comes through challenges, which we don't want to be there. As the worship team comes, the final thing we do is resist. Resist the temptation to resent the hard edges of God's will. See, sometimes God's will is being played out in our life, but we don't want it to be there. And how many have ever had a teenager or someone when they don't get what they wanted, when you have to tell them no, They want to be seen as, as respecting you. They want to be seen as respecting your authority in their life. But they walk around the house for the next week kind of looking at you. I need you to do the dishes. Ka-clang, ka-clang, ka-clang. They just throw the silverware at the dishwasher. My, my girls, when they get up here, they know what I'm talking about. Well, I need you to drive your brother down to the school. <sighs> See, well, I'm, I'm submitting to your authority. No, you're not. Not really. Your attitude is saying, well, on the surface, I want to be seen as someone who submits to your authority. But in my attitude and in my heart, I'm going to let you know how I really feel. Fine, God, I'll go to church. Fine. I mean, you want to talk about trials, listening to one more sermon by Pastor Chuck, that's trial enough. We do that in our lives, and we butt up against him. We say, no, we've submitted to God. But have you really? See, the temptation to resent the hard edges of God's will, it's tough. So next time, God's will and your will don't see eye to eye. And before you get bent out of shape, remind yourself that you don't know all the circumstances. So you can't make a definitive assessment of the situation as to whether it's ultimately good or bad. Remember that God claims his will is good, acceptable, and perfect. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Concentrate on the positive things that you know can come out of his plan and only his plan. You may be surprised at the way life becomes less of a struggle and God's will becomes less of a problem in your life. I want to make sure that I recap this. In no way do I want you to walk out of here frustrated. In no way do I want you to walk out of here feeling defeated. I want you to walk out of here feeling empowered, knowing that if you will hang on to God, his will, and his direction, you've got nothing to fear nothing you can walk uprightly you can walk into any storm into any situation and you will be that beacon of light that this world needs but if you're secretly perturbed by his will and and you want to throw the dishes around when he asks you to do things people are going to see that too people need to see a light and that light only comes from God and it only comes from his will, not ours. When people egg you on to fight about something political, don't do it. 
When they egg you on to enter the battle about mask or no mask, don't do it. You know what? It doesn't matter. I can put a mask on and worship Jesus. I can have my mask off and worship Jesus. He's still the same God. The same impact upon my life. And the world needs to see our love. Not our political stance. The world needs to see love. That is the will of God. So take your will, roll it up, trash it. Grab onto what he's got for you. And I'm telling you what, life gets easier and easier the more you will do that. Because life is not going to be predictable. And when two hours turns to 20 minutes, we have to resist the temptation to accuse God of breaking promises and realize that you are in training for something much, much larger yet to come. Heavenly Father, praise and glorify your name. Father God, I thank you for these people, this church, this community. Father, I thank you for this time that you have placed us here. For a time such as this, you have put us here. Father, let us embrace everything that you present to us. Father, let us know clearly what your will is above ours. Let us hear your voice. Let us stay in communication with you. Father, let us change and grow in a way that we make an impact on those that need you the most. Father, I just praise and glorify you for every blessing that you have given us. Let us recognize it. Let us pick our heads up and see it. And Father, let us stand boldly when our two hours turns into 20 minutes. Father, we praise and glorify your name. Ask that you be with all these people. Put your arms around us as a family and bring us back different than when we came. In your sweet and precious name we pray.